Yes, so the film is called The Woman Who Poked the Leopard. And it's about um, the fact that after a lot of activism that led Stella Nyanzi to jail, she comes out of jail even stronger and says, I'm going to run for parliament. Um, and she leads a very strong campaign that ends up in failure. Um, you know, she doesn't get elected, but that doesn't stop her as well. Um, she puts a bit of a break and, and decides to go to her ancestral home, but police find her there and try to intimidate her even more, leading her to choose whether to take her children to safety in exile or to stay home and fight. Um, so it was uh, uh, like a few days after Stella came out of jail. She had lost a baby due to police torture. She had um, shaved off her locks. She was looking frail. And when she left jail, she came to our home for lunch. And I looked at her and thought, I don't know how long we have with this woman, but I don't want to be one of the people saying, what was the Stella story? What was the Stella Nyanzi story? While you know the world, uh, like Rosie said, makes up stories about her and how she's crazy and all those things. So I decided, like, let me ask, who is telling your story? So I asked her bluntly, like, who who is documenting this? Like, you you have a strong story to tell, and it's already like time is going, and 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 I want to know if somebody is documenting it. At that moment, just. Um, sort of playfully said, you know, if you want to tell my story, you're welcome to. Um, I don't think there's anything there, but go ahead. And I think from that moment, I was just excited when she said, like, go ahead and tell it. And it took me a few weeks to actually realize she had given me permission. We started filming um, sort of to say, OK, let's just start. If we fail to make this film, at least we'll have tried. Um, and so we, the more we, we filmed, the more we just got um, in and decided like we can't stop. And I think everything changed for me when I found Rosie. I actually contacted her asking like, do you know any producers that would be interested in this? And she was like, of course I'm interested. And so we really started working together and it just became easier from that, you know, day forward. It was like, um, everything changed and we were clear what we both wanted with the story. Stella was happy too that Rosie was on board and the rest is history. Now we are coming to the end of the film, yeah, of the project. Uh, so that was 2020 when she came out of jail, early 2020, like Jan or Feb. Um, and she had been in jail because of a poem that she wrote in which she wished that the president had been suffocated at birth by his mother's vagina because of the way he has suffocated our country with corruption and um, all other oppressive um, things that he does. So, um, I mean, she had been to jail before that. She had been to jail because of her writing. She had protested um, um, a few times before. She had lost her job at the university. She's an academic. She has um, um, she was a, a, a researcher at Makere University where she lost her job and, and, and it launched her first protest, um, her first nude protest. And that was, I think, in 2016. Um, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and, and I think for her, uh, once she she started um, getting out into the public and protesting, she couldn't stop. She just kept growing and growing. Um, and I think part of the reason I wanted to actually tell her story was um, people are always labeling her as the woman who, who likes to get naked when she's unhappy but she's explained countless times before like she tried everything at Makira University for instance um, and it failed and she says people want me to be civil but civility has failed us it's failed me before and it hasn't done anything but when I use the language that I use and the methods that I use people listen and that was important to me because I knew that she's not that person that media presents to us as the crazy person who just gets her clothes off. I had met her, I had been with her at a protest um, when femicide, um, during the femicide in Kampala in 2018, I think. And I had, I had, I had listened to her, I had realized she's just this very uh, collaborative person that wants to like uh, 
um, lead in a very authentic feminist way. And people were labeling her this person that I knew she was not. And I, I really wanted to tell like a holistic story about um, what I see in her, what what her age is and why I get it. And, and yeah, I think that was very important to me. You know, one of the other things that, that I've noticed, particularly not just about African feminist stories, but about African stories, is that as much as we 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 need the partnerships with with um stakeholders outside of the continent, often the meaning and the authenticity is lost in the story because they're telling their side of the story. So I'm very glad that patience was able to 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 see that. Um, and yeah, you know the, the 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 journey hasn't been that easy um, because you got you've got you've got you got two people, one from different countries in Africa, telling a story about that's that's very very provocative. Um, but but I'm glad that 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 you know patients um, still push through with the authenticity because at the end of the day, that is exactly what Dr. Stell is about. You know what you what when you meet her, when you see her, when you read her writing, she just she 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 calls a spade a spade, which I think is incredibly powerful.